Welcome back to class. In this lecture, we're going to talk about industry analysis. There's a number of stylized steps in an industry analysis. The first one is going to be looking at the dominant economic traits of an industry. And as we think about the situation analysis, we want to begin, to, before we decide to work with strategy, we have to understand the industry that we're in right now. So as we think about situation analysis, the industry analysis really looks at the external or macroeconomic environment, the industry and competitive conditions. The company's internal or microeconomic environment are things related to its competencies, capabilities, resource strengths and weaknesses, and competitiveness. So as we think about this lecture and the upcoming lectures, we're going to be looking at the, industry, the economic traits as part of industry analysis. Once we complete those seven steps, we then are going to look at the internal analysis of the firm. Those two things together, the industry analysis and the firm analysis, will help us identify strategic options for the company to move forward and then select the best strategy for the company. So a good situation analysis is going to help us lead to making good strategy choices for a firm. So as we think about the first step or the first question, if you will, what are the industry's economic traits? So as we think about these, market size and growth rate are one of them. This course is about the food economy. So as we think about that, we think about the market size and growth rate. One way to measure the market size is simply taking the number of people times the per capita consumption of a certain food. So if we were to think about what's the market size of beef, for example, we would look at some U.S. Department of Agriculture data on beef consumption per person and multiply that by the number of people. That would give us a volume measure of the market size of the quantity of beef consumed in the United States. So we could do that using annual data because the U.S. Department of Agriculture reports this data annually. And we could use that and measure an arithmetic growth rate. And so as we think about this, just what is the growth rate arithmetically from year to year? So there's a number of ways of looking at market size. That's a volume measure, which is a good way to think about it. We could look at sales, and oftentimes, sometimes it's difficult to get at quantities. So we could look at sales volume rates per year and also measure sales um, as, a, as a market size. A second thing we can look at is the capac capacity utilization and the resource requirements to run a plant. So oftentimes in the processing sector, you will find trade associations or other individuals that will just make comments like, in the fourth quarter of this year, we observed the industry was running at 85% capacity utilization. What that means is the industry is not using 15%, 100%, minus 85% they were using, yields 15%. So anytime a firm is not able to run at 100% capacity, they're going to have higher costs because they can't spread their fixed cost across all of those other types of um, capacity units. So it's important for an industry to use as much capacity as it possibly can. And to measure that, you want to look at how well the firms are looking at running their capacity. So in the fall of 2019, AMPI, or Associated Milk Producers Inc., announced they were closing two dairy plants in the upper Midwest of the United States. What that suggests was they had excess plant capacity for processing milk. That was due to the exits of dairy farmers during this time period, which left AMPI with too much volume in their plants, and the only way to run at full capacity was to decrease some of that volume. So you'll see measures like this, and trade associations will often report annually what are the entrants and exits, who's building plants, who's closing plants, where they're being built, and help you understand what's going on in the industry. A third measure is looking at the industry profitability. If an industry is profitable and making profits above some long-term average, you're going to find people who want to enter this industry because they see its profitability. If the industry is not as profitable, you're going to look at firms saying, maybe I have to exit this industry because the firm because it's not as profitable. So we want to look at industry in a, in a short period of time, like a year. And we also want to look at industry profitability 
over time. So that leads us to our fourth thing, the entry and exit barriers. There are some industries, for example, breakfast manufacturing, where the cost of making a breakfast manufacturing plant is so difficult. The ability to make, for example, different types of breakfast cereals in one factory, hot and cold, or to make things like, like in Northfield, Minnesota, Mom Brands, which is now part of Post Holdings, Inc., that factory in Northfield makes both warm products, multi meal, for example, and cold breakfast cereal packages. So that particular plant is multi-useful, and there are only several plants like that around the world that can make both cold cereal and warm cereal. So as we think about entry and exit barriers, Post Holdings, which owns that factory, is not going to likely close that plant because it's the only one that does that. And because of the, the market for warm breakfast cereal may not be growing very quickly, it's not likely that someone else is going to build a plant like that that can make cold cereals and warm cereals. So it's important to look at entry and exit barriers. Breakfast cereal manufacturing plants are very expensive. To get a return on that investment, those plants are going to have to help those firms like General Mills, Kellogg's, and others make profits to pay for the returns, which are hundreds of millions of dollars on a plant like that. That's a very significant entry barrier. Other individuals are not going to want to build plants like that because the return on that capital will become less because we may have too much market capacity. The other way to think about this is exit barriers. So if I'm going to close a plant, what happens? It may be difficult to find a buyer for that plant. That plant may just sit there. So for example, in the sugar beet processing industry, there's probably 25 or 30 old sugar beet factories scattered all across the United States. These factories have no alternative use. They process sugar beets one day, and then these, these plants were no longer processing sugar beets. There were no buyers for those plants, and so they just sit empty. And so if you know what to look for, you'll oftentimes see these factories just sitting empty in the middle of a countryside somewhere where they used to produce sugar beets. The exit barriers were very simple. Just shut the factory down and leave it sit. Do things, for example, to stop people from breaking into it and putting themselves in harm's way by climbing it or going different things. Shutting off the water and electricity and doing things like that, taking care of the septic. Um, but the ability to enter an industry and exit an industry, it's important to understand what those, what those look like. Product and customer characteristics. So as we think about economic traits, many food products require lots of innovation. So those products can be very complicated. There are food safety issues that have to come into play. Um, so the product characteristics in the food economy have to be understood. You can't just take an animal or a fruit or a vegetable or a kernel of grain and immediately manufacture it as something that's a consumer ready product. There's a number of things that have to happen as we transform a hot chain or a cold chain um, to take care of those. The same thing is true in customers. Not all consumers are the same. So some types of consumers are just individuals like you and I. We buy a piece of food, take it home, cook it, um, or consume it. But other buyers are more complicated. So if I'm in the food service industry, or if I've got a restaurant, I've got to keep, I've got to think more about perishability, large volumes, the type of people coming into my restaurant, all of those things are pretty important. We have to think about the nature and pace of technological change. Is this an industry that's quickly going through change or not? So think, for example, flour milling. We take wheat, we do something with the wheat, and we make a, a product from that wheat. In this case, it's flour. We grind it and make flour. If you were to think about how we, we do this wheat, for example, oftentimes we're using the same package that we used 50, 60, 80 years ago. My mother and my grandfather that went to the store to buy a bag of flour would still buy it in the same paper, somewhat leaky, five pound bag of flour. So we don't see, we have not seen much change in the packaging related to flour. That suggests that people still use flour in the way it's being used and there's not much innovation going on or much money being made to justify putting flour into a 
uh, a container, for example, or a Ziploc bag. You see some products like that, but they tend to be more expensive. So from a technology change standpoint, flour milling has not seen much type of change. Other industries, we've seen lots of change. Think about things like salsa or things like soup, where we've gone to these heart-healthy soups and, and removed sodium and so forth. Put tops on seal cans that pull off as opposed to having to use a, a can opener. There may be several of you on this, watching this lecture today that have no idea what a can opener is because everything you buy comes in a pouch that you rip the pouch across it and it's got a Ziploc container on the top or it's got a flip off uh, can if it's a steel can but you may not even have a, a um, can opener in your cupboard at home. We have to think about scale economies and experience curve effects. So these are things like how, what's the cost curve look like? Is a very sharp long run average cost curve like you see in microeconomics or is it relatively flat? And so as we think about that, what's the shape of those curves? We want to think about the prevalence of backwards or forward integration. So are firms using contracts? Are they actually going backwards and, and integrating forwards and backwards? We're going to look at some case studies in the class in, in this type of integration. We have to think about the scope of competitive rivalry. How do firms compete? Do they compete on price? Do they compete on product services? The reality is much of the food industry is what we call monopolistic competition. All that says is all products, firms do a lot of marketing to make their products look different. They do advertising. They have product innovation. They take their food products and try to make them somewhat different, but they're still buying from the same type of farmers as everyone else. They're still all selling to the same type of consumers. They're just trying to differentiate their products. And lastly, we want to know what the number of competitors we have is and what their relative sizes are. Are there lots of people in this industry or just a handful? In breakfast, in breakfast manufacturing, there may only be a couple of companies because the costs are so high to build these factories. And they also may produce warm products, cold products, and they also may produce pouches, granola bars, or, or other type of things, yogurts and other types of things in that industry. We want to know their size, their volume size, the number of products that they have. So as we think about these key economic features, here's another way of looking at these. I'm not going to go through all these. You've got to copy these in the Canvas module, but these are examples and describing of what I just went through in this lecture. So that's step one, or part one in industry analysis, discussion of the key economic traits or features in an industry.